Good morning. I'm Sita Beltran. Uh, welcome to the program agenda. Welcome. I don't know if you got my intro correctly there, but good morning. I'm Sita Beltran. Welcome to the program agenda. And today is April 16, Thursday. Just a heads up, ladies and gentlemen, in case you see me looking at so many uh, different places, it's the reality of work from home because uh, I have one phone that I have to watch to coordinate with my executive producer. I have to check on the monitor on my laptop so that I can see what's happening with my guest or our interview. I have to look at the camera and I have to read the uh, prompt board or what's been written for me. But in any case, <clears throat> it's, it's a new normal and uh, we hope that you are doing well this morning. We hope that you are healthy that uh, you are uh, you are strong and you are safe at home and not wandering about. So let's get on with the news first. And in the headlines, the curve is flattening. COVID recoveries surpass Philippine deaths. For the first time since the enhanced community quarantine was implemented in Luzon, the number of recoveries has exceeded the death toll. In yesterday's update from the health department, 58 new patients recovered from the virus, bringing the total number of recoveries to 353. The deaths, on the other hand, was tallied at 349 with 14 new fatalities. Our condolences to the family who lost a loved one and it's not really something to celebrate because 14 deaths are 14 deaths. But in any case, at least there is light at the end of the tunnel. We have now we now have more recoveries than the number of dead people. Uh, the government is eyeing a rolling start of the economy, according to a member of the interagency task force for IATF. The selective and gradual lifting of the enhanced community quarantine may be done after the 30th of April in order to get the economy rolling. Okay, that's uh, from the special advisor, medical advisor of uh, the IATF, Dr. Anthony Lechon, uh, who said that the rolling reopening may be done uh, may, be the, may be localized. However, he also pointed out that for this to take place, the task force should see to it that metrics have been met. What are these metrics? The performance of a said locality in addressing the crisis, how they've managed the crisis, which include testing capacity, human resource in health, and other campaigns in fighting the program. Lea Chon said, some areas that are poised for this reopening are Valenzuela City, Pasig City, and the province of Cavite. The PNP cracks the whip on quarantine violators. Philippine National Police is set to intensify its efforts to prevent unnecessary travel while the enhanced community quarantine is still up. President Duterte has, has ordered the PNP Highway Patrol Group to, to check private vehicles and see if the driver and passengers belong to the list of authorized persons to leave their residences. If, HPG, uh, if not, the HPG will issue violation tickets against these drivers. Those exempted from the ban include health workers, essential laborers like supermarket staff, media, and bank employees. As of April 13, the PNP has recorded over 108,000 violators of the ECQ. The PhilHealth has announced that they will limit the uh, payout for COVID-19 cases. However, Cagayan de Oro Congressman Rufus Rodriguez appealed to President Duterte and the IATF for PhilHealth to shoulder the full cost of COVID-19 treatment. This after the agency implements a new case rate 
which would limit the coverage for COVID patients. PhilHealth Executive Vice President for Corporate, Corporate Affairs, Shirley Domingo, said the new case rates will ensure the sustainability of the subsidy they provide. The new case rates include a different package for various categories of pneumonia, which is usually the complication for COVID-19. Mild cases get over 43,000 coverage, uh, while uh, 143,000 pesos for moderate cases, 333,000 for severe pneumonia, and over 786,000 pesos for the critical cases. Before the, these rates, PhilHealth was shouldering in full the hospitalization of COVID-19 patients. Next, six Nueva Ecija hospitals will be probed or investigated for rejecting a 65-year-old patient. The National Bureau of Investigation, or NBI, are looking into the possible liabilities of six hospitals in Nueva Ecija, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> following orders of Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara, this after the hospitals allegedly refused to admit a 65-year-old patient identified as Ladislao Kabiling, who had difficulty breathing and sadly died hours later in his own home. Kabiling's daughter said the six hospitals turned him away because they lacked intensive care unit or ICU facilities. And uh, that's uh, up for the news. And uh, in case uh, some of our friends out there in the islands are wondering, what else may be featured in the news? Uh, well, uh, according to the Philippine Star headline, the uh, pre U.S. President Donald Trump has uh, freezed or uh, decided to freeze the U.S. contribution to the World Health Organization. In any case, uh, we'll try to give you more news. But for the meantime, let's go to our first interview. And I'm sure... You are all familiar with our next guest, who is a, well, I won't call him a two-time winner, but he is certainly beginning to qualify as a two-time survivor of a global disaster, uh, having survived Yolanda, and he was in the epicenter of it, and now he is still uh, doing uh, a lot of work fighting off COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic. <coughs> Excuse me. In, in his uh, locality. We have with us uh, Mayor Alfred Romualdez of Tacloban City. Mayor Alfred, I hope you're there. Yes. Good morning, Sito. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. I don't know if, if you heard my intro. You are uh, legitimately a two-time survivor of COVID-19. And uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, there are very few people I know who've actually survived. I, I was in Tacloban uh, at the latter, uh, during the latter part, so I guess I'm in that list, but uh, to have survived or to have witnessed two, two global disasters, just really disturbing. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, you know, it, we were fortunate that, you know, we continued our relationship with the international community. And as early as January, you know, we... Uh, we were aware of the outbreak already in China. In fact, uh, I remember the third week of January, we ordered the city health officers uh, to conduct now uh, all arrivals in our airport to fill up a form so we can do contact tracing just in case you know we were hit you know with the COVID-19. And uh, we remember the H1N1 when that hit us about 10 years ago. And uh, we are fortunate because we established uh, different health centers in clustered barangays to monitor uh, if there's anyone uh, that came from abroad or outside that we can monitor closely uh, this, uh, this uh, virus. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate that uh, as of today, uh, we, don't, we have zero cases in Tacloban. Although in the region where we have six provinces, we have about four cases and uh, out of the four, two already have left the hospital and are okay. So we just have another two that are still, uh, you know, waiting. Uh, but they're surviving and no deaths yet of uh, COVID-19, thank God, you know. 
So you're more or less uh, medically prepared, or at least you know in the health management side, you made preparations. What about uh, taking care of your know, of your constituents? Because uh, you have quite a big population in Tacloban, and you are a, a city which presents problems in terms of food, uh, in terms of uh, taking care of people. What have you been doing? Because uh, a lot of the local government officials were not prepared for this, and, and they have had nightmares, and they have been criticized uh, unfairly, harshly. But uh, what what's going on in Tacloban? Well, uh, immediately uh, when we heard of the lockdown, you know, in uh, NCR, uh, immediately we knew that uh, it's only a question of time that we have to do the same. And, uh, you know, in Tacloban City, we have three universities here. We have an average of about 100,000 students. And, uh, you know, in comes to disasters and things like this, uh, my main uh, goal really in the first couple of days is to decongest the city because we're just too many uh, people. In fact, uh, recorded here, we're close to a million people during the day, but our nighttime population is about 350 or 300,000. So immediately, you know, when I did that, I gave them time, a couple of days, wherein they could leave the city and go back to their respective provinces. And then from then, we did now an assessment uh, with CSWD uh, and our city disaster in uh, determining now uh, how much and uh, how many people do we have to serve in terms of relief goods. But at the same time, you know, we learn from a disaster that uh, everything you do must uh, have um, multiple uh, effects and uh, you cannot do something and go back and redo, you know, or we cannot afford to make too many mistakes. So what we realized here was uh, what happened before during the Yanda, they flooded our city with rice. Like they were giving one sack of rice per family. It just flooded the city with rice and it killed the local economy. So what we did now was to determine the amount of uh, members of the family and uh, how much rice, but we focused on uh, locally produced rice so we can help our farmers. And uh, we did that in some areas that don't have a proper uh, refrigerator or uh, refrigerator to preserve the food we started delivering a live uh, chicken and uh, in areas also we started delivering fish fresh food because what happened uh, during Yolanda three months later our city hospital was filled with people with gout and you know all sorts of uh, uh, problems because uh, too much canned goods for you know if this is prolonged for more than 30 days it's not advisable so it was also given them awareness that, uh, that uh, you know, we have to strengthen our immune system, you know, and we started going back. And I personally had to talk to my father and, you know, how did they survive during World War II? You know, how what made them, you know, all our parents now, you know, survive up to the age of 90, 90 plus, you know. So we have to go back and learn from them and go back to basics. So basically, itong ginawa namin. And then when I locked down, I also learned from other countries that, uh, you know, it's a, a must. In fact, from you, we were talking at that time and you mentioned that, yes, it is important to, you know, make it mandatory that everybody wear a mask and, uh it's also one story itong uh, sinasabi na, na social distancing. Yeah. So immediately we, we enforced that and we enforced that very strongly. And, uh, you know, it worked. In fact, nakita namin like now that uh, so far, uh, the latest test we had, we had about 20 suspects and uh, we sent the uh, swabs to Cebu and uh, it came back all negative. So, you know, we were happy with that. And But it's not easy. It's also difficult. In fact, uh Isa sa mga naging problema namin, what, uh, what uh, shook us was uh, last week they released uh, the four piece and they released about 15,000 recipients. So, you know, when you release 15,000, it flooded the streets with all these people, uh, you know, receiving their, their four piece. And obviously, if you give them money, they have to spend it. You know, it's like giving a person water, but you won't allow him to go to the toilet after drinking water. I mean, mm -hmm. so obviously it's flooded. And if you talk about uh, one square meter per person, you have about 500 people lining up. Then that's already half a kilometer. 
So mm-hmm. you know, we did the math and we we focused. That's why we immediately dispatched mobile uh, mobile uh, uh, food uh, to be to go all over the city. Uh, so you know, people could buy. Uh, from these uh, trucks that were going around just to prevent them from going out. And uh, if you see, and in fact, ang kinakabahan namin ngayon, uh, although mga kabuti sa tao yung magbibigay ng amelioration, pero ang target nila is like 51,000 families. So you have 51,000 representatives. And if you put them in one square meter, that's 51,000 square meters. And if you look at it, that's more than five hectares of people. So it's really difficult, you know, to contain. And mm-hmm. also being a highly urbanized city, when we're in the center of the region, that's another big problem we have because uh, when you compute the IRA that uh, they gave support, national government gave support, but there's some uh, cities that, you know, have half of our population and they get more of the IRA because it's based on their land area, mas malaki. We maintain. We have central bank here, a majority of the banks, because it's the finance center. Uh, all the hospitals, the big hospitals, are here, and uh, it's very difficult. And so, but we have to make do with you know whatever is uh, given to us for support. But there are many learnings, and I think you know it's important to go back uh, during disasters and you know to see what happened. In fact, uh, what we have to realize, what the economic managers have to realize that. All highly urbanized cities are all interrelated and connected. We cannot function here as long as, you know, NCR, you know, prolongs their lockdown. It will affect the economy of all highly urbanized cities. And we're focused on that, you know. Yeah, I I remember at one point uh, you were quoted as saying that you were trapped between uh, two different or, or, you know, you were in the middle of uh, many uh, other island municipalities or cities. And if one did a lockdown, like let's say when Cebu did their lockdown, you got hit when Southern Leyte implemented their lockdown or their roadblocks, you got hit. And finally, you were forced to tell the shippers use the ports in Tacloban or you open the port. I'm not clear whether you have a port in Tacloban, but it made me realize that all uh, municipal island municipalities should start having their own ports and and not have to rely on the land land connection. Uh, actually, that what happened there was uh, when we had a meeting with all the uh, meat vendors and the meat suppliers of Tacloban, they had a problem because, you know, uh, I spoke to Secretary Dar at that time and uh, because sinabayan ito ng uh, sinasabi na swine flu, no? So we had no pork at all here in Tacloban. And uh, the problem was, you know, it's not entirely Mindanao that, you know, uh, has the swine flu fever. There are only, you know, uh, specific areas. So what we were lobbying here in Tacloban is that... Uh, if you have complete papers coming from the national meat inspectors coming from Mindanao, they should allow this port to enter and go to Tacloban City because this is the center and, uh, you know, we have a very big population and it would help especially now in our crisis. But ang nangyayari, yung ibang mga local governments, ang yung ginawa nila, outright they just banned all pork, you know. So, you know, it became very difficult for us. Because now is the time that we really have to support our food producers and farmers, our fishermen. And this is what we're doing now, you know, because we're going to expect them to plant more so that next year, you know, just in case uh, Thailand and Cambodia, those who supply us rice would start slowing down their uh, export, then, you know, we will have some food to rely on. And, you know, the best time now is to really help our people. Okay, what, what about those ports that you uh, you mentioned, uh, I think a few weeks back, that you opened the port of Tacloban or you were working with shippers to ship directly to Tacloban? Uh, yes. Because I think it's, it's something that many local officials could uh, duplicate because if, if they rely on the, by land uh, from NCR going to let's say, to Tacloban by land or vice versa, uh, it's going to take more than a week. Uh, it will probably take 15 days to clear all of those checkpoints. In fact, that, that's that's true. In fact, uh, 
you know, I was encouraging uh, uh, meat suppliers to uh, charter some vessels coming from Mindanao, and you can land that vessel directly in the port of Tacloban. And having the proper documents, we will clear it, you know, because we also have a double A slaughterhouse here, which is very big. It's the only one in the region. And uh, so we can mass produce right away, uh, uh, have some food production and focus on our food security here in the region. So it's uh, <clears throat> uh, opening the port or uh, making the port more available and then uh, also food production already. You're already starting now. You're not going to wait for this uh, uh, pandemic to tide over. You you will take and then rely supporting local producers. Yes. <laughs> do that. In fact, I think, uh, you know, with the help of the DILG, what they should see now is like, you know, what I see now in NCR, I was talking to some doctors there last night and the other nights, and their concern is they do massive testing in Metro Manila, but what assurance do they have in the next few days that the guy or the one they tested doesn't get contaminated because they're having a hard time quarantining these people. So my suggestion would be put this uh, testing, rapid test in airports and in ports. And the government should have a program, Balik Provincia program, that for those you know who realize now, I mean, obviously, Sita, you can see two weeks from now, if you decide to open uh, Manila, will restaurants have in dining? I don't think so. I mean, with the situation they're having now. So, you know, you have a lot of people that don't have jobs and are just sitting there and they have provinces to go home to. And uh, I think, you know, the rapid test should be done in ports. And, you know, we start uh, maybe a few domestic flights in flying people out. Because when that happened, when our disaster hit us in uh, Yolanda, my battle cry was for all women and children to leave the city and the men leave and the, main, the men remain so we can rehab our city as soon as possible. I think, uh, you know, it's a double whammy what's happening in NCR. You've got your the center of your, your economy is basically, you know, based in Metro Manila. And at the same time, you have a very high population there. You know, it's really very difficult for them to recover. And we in the regions outside should help NCR decongest uh, NCR in, in order that, you know, we can save the economy because most of all highly urbanized cities are connected to Metro Manila. That's really the reality there. And uh, we cannot, even in Tacloban, if we have zero here, I can say that we can open our city tomorrow. But the difficulty here would be, you know, uh, we cannot really do much because our neighbors are all locked down. And the difficulty here, when you have a lockdown, they allow people to leave, but they don't allow people to enter. And the danger part there, if we have people leaving without proper testing, then, you know, then the spread of the virus will happen. But for me, to make it really more realistic and more uh, effective, test the people that are leaving Manila. Encourage them, have a program, give that amelioration as an incentive, give it when they leave NCR. Especially those who are jobless and those who are just hanging around and they have provinces to go home. Okay, well, uh, I think we got quite a lot of good inputs from you, uh, Mayor Alfred Romaldes, and uh, we'll have to uh, move on to our next guest, and we hope that you will stay safe, <clears throat> stay strong, and stay healthy, and may God continue to bless you and the people of Tacloban. You are true-to-life survivors. God bless all of you. Thank you. God bless us. Thank you. Okay. And that's Mayor Alfred Romaldes. Uh, quite a number of good inputs. Uh, number one is now is the time to plan uh, for food production, self-reliance, uh, test people in Metro Manila uh, who want to leave, who want to go to the provinces, test them, clear them, and when they are cleared, uh, refer them or recommend them for uh, uh, travel and then also uh, opening ports or building up ports, uh, streamlining ports so that we are not totally dependent on our roads or go, uh, delivering by land. Okay, we have online now the uh, spokesperson and the basically the face of the uh, interagency task force on emergency, emerging con uh, infectious diseases we have with us uh, Secretary to the Cabinet, Carlo Nograles. Magandang umaga po, sir. Hi, magandang umaga sa iyo, Sito, at uh, magandang umaga sa lahat na nakikinig at nanonood ngayon. Good morning. 
Bago tayo mag-umpisa, pinapaabot ko lang sa iyo and ito po ay hindi biro uh, taus-puso itong pinakuusap sa akin ipaabot sa iyo that you are su doing such a great job. A lot of people are really impressed with your dedication and your professionalism and your ability to stay cool kahit na may mga nangungulit na at nangiintriga na. Then <laughs> <laughs> hindi naman namin 'yan. Everybody just wants their questions answered. So we try to answer the questions as much as we can, as extensively as we can also, Shempre. Okay, okay. I know you don't have a lot of time, so I'll go straight into the questions. First would be, uh, a lot of people are really asking, have been asking me, will this end on April 30? Makakalabas na ba kami? Uh, uh, Makakaikot na ba kami April 30? Uh, what's the situation, Secretary? Well, right now, uh, ba to? Kahap, uh, the other day, uh, the other night, uh, inutusan na ni Pangulong Duterte um, a small uh, economic team na trusted niya to already start looking at uh, what to do after April 30. Meaning to say, anong mga industries uh, can uh, open, um, anong mga businesses that can open, and what sort of work force uh, will we allow no and then to look also at other sectors like uh, transportation and um all of these things no but with obviously with certain parameters at kasama po dyan yung tuloy-tuloy pa rin na social distancing yung personal hygiene disinfection wearing of masks um etc etc so um, pinag-aaralan na ito and the team has already been tasked to already input all of the data, to input um, all of the factors that they have to look at. And uh, kahapon, nagkaroon kami ng IATF meeting um, and the promise was by Monday, uh, this coming Monday, no? um, yeah. they'll have something to present already to the IATF. But it's not um, guaranteed na um, the IATF will, will already come up with a decision by Monday. Kasi syempre, pag-uusapan pa namin extensively yan, and then we will make the recommendations to the President. So that's in preparation for what will happen after April 30. Okay, before we get to April 30, maraming mga hindi makapaghintay. Uh, there's so many individuals, people... Uh, who have been going to public markets, uh, driving across EDSA, uh, even uh, people uh, test driving their motorcycles, etc. And, and nasa headline na nga ng Philippine Star na nagkakahulihan na. Has yeah. this been brought to the attention of the president? And uh, are we going to see even stricter implementation? Yeah, actually, si Pangulo napansin niya na rin yan. Eh. And that's the reason why inutusan niya ang DILG, ang ating mga kapulisan, na higpitan na. Because I think, um, you know, people started becoming more lax and lenient. At uh, maraming sa Pilipino pa, maraming mga sumasaway na. So, uh, oh, kaya, yeah, mga pasaway. So, kaya... Kahapon, uh, hinigpitan na. The Philippine National Police already brought in the HPG. At uh, marami nang na ano eh, marami na na rin na tiketan, mm -hmm. uh, marami na rin na huli, uh, na, na lumalabag na nga. Um, so, naging mas mahigpit na po uh, dun sa mga highways, no, as far as highways are concerned. Pagating naman sa public markets, hinigpitan na rin po nila because uh, naglagay na ng ang PNP uh, at nag-join forces na po ang AFP at PNP dito. No? Nagkaroon ng AFP-PNP joint task groups already uh, that uh, became stricter pagdating sa markets. And then obviously, we'll need the help of the... We, uh, we got the help of the LGUs here. So basically, they did a one entry, one exit um, sort of uh, procedure sa mga public markets natin. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're asking the LGUs na to police their own ranks. Um, na dapat, uh, kahit na maglagay kami ng one entry, one exit, pipila pa rin ang tao, magkakaroon pa rin ng pila if you don't put a system in place. And the system in place that we're asking the LGUs to do is siguro um, put a system na kung saan magkaroon ng rotation 
na hindi naman per barangay siguro or per sector ng ganilang locality ang magkaroon ng rotation kung kailan sila pwedeng pumunta ng palengke. Um, and then um, some of the public markets like in Quezon City, tinanggal na rin nila yung retail. Uh, so naging wholesale market na lang po yan. So these mechanisms, as we see the need to um, enforce stricter procedures, Um, combined naman yan, eh, IATF and the LGUs and the uh, DILG are looking for all of these stricter parameters and protocols pagdating sa mga public places. Okay, uh, I don't know if you caught uh, our interview with uh, Mayor Alfred Romualdez of Tacloban uh, where he was making a what seemed to be a very valid suggestion. Uh, that we test individuals. Siguro, umpisahan natin with people who were stranded in Manila when the ECQ was implemented. Uh, test them, a uh, rapid testing, and then allow them to exit Metro Manila, particularly yung mga laborers, yung mga uh, empleyado na nakatira sa probinsya pero nagtatrabaho sa Metro Manila because what's happening is uh, if we can decongest Metro Manila, it lessens the burden of LGUs and the national government. Would would the IATF consider that uh, constructive, uh, the very sensible suggestion, test and and uh, uh, send home to Balik Provincia, he was calling it? Yeah, actually, um, nagkaroon din kami ng extensive discussion ng rapid test kits no, uh, kahapon mm -hmm. during the IATF meeting. So, Um, magkakaroon ng mga panibagong guidelines ngayon ng Department of Health with regard to the use of those rapid test kits. At siguro narinig din na rin naman kahapon or the other day na inutos na ni Pangulo uh, that government will now uh, purchase those rapid test kits yes. and, uh, and uh, place it uh, in our health protocols already. Yes. So dun sa discussions, uh, one of the advantages ng rapid test kits uh, that we see is Um, actually, ang rapid test kit will be a very good measure to find out sino na yung nagkaroon ng immunity sa virus. No? Mm -hmm. So the IgG uh, of the rapid test kits actually actually is able to test if a person has been has uh, actually not only been uh, has been cured of the yes. um, of the virus. No. And that gives us a mechanism to give clearance to persons na, oh, naka, may antibody ka na. So you're sort of um, recovered already from, from uh, the COVID-19 and you're clear to go. So we can insert that in the protocols in terms of yung uh, clearing uh, patients. No? Uh, so in that manner, dun sa suggestion ni um, Mayor Alfred, Uh, then we can also, you know, we can also consider that. No, the DOH can also consider that. When, I guess you're talking the context of after April 13, no? before yeah. we allow people to start going back to the provinces. That can be considered because the IgG test, the rapid test kits, uh, is able to detect if a person has already recovered uh, from the uh, COVID-19 and develop yeah. the antibody against it. Yeah, because apparently uh, Mayor Romualdez uh, had been in conversation with uh, numerous doctors and the general concern was, yes, we will do rapid testing or the normal testing and we will clear people, but then we are still bringing, sending them back to the herd and uh, they, where they can get eventually contaminated. So our suggestion is those who want to get out of Metro Manila You go to a particular process, have yourself tested, board the boat or board the plane, and get out of Metro Manila, uh, much like way they did in Tacloban. But yeah. in any case, um, actually, uh, pwede, pwede yan, ano? I'm, I'm also uh, thinking out loud here. I'm not yeah. speaking uh, in behalf of the IATF, but uh, siguro we, we could do a combination. No? After sabi natin uh, pag gusto bumalik ng probinsya, no? And again, I'm speaking. Uh, of course, uh, that's a personal opinion, no? Yeah, If of course. It can be inserted. Uh, in the protocol, then maybe pwede ka magpa-test, no, rapid test. If you're clear to go, then you can go back to the province. Pagdating sa probinsya, mag, pwede, 
ka mag 14 day quarantine don just to be mm. super safe no so mm. something like that uh, something in that direction can be considered by the IATF do you mind if i ask you to please raise all of your fingers kasi balita ko sabi ni Ted 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 Diloxin lahat daw ng daliri mo butas na eh <laughs> hindi hindi naman twice lang nangyari <laughs> he just okay. exaggerated. So yeah. whenever we go, uh, there's a there's a rapid test kit. So we we test. So twice yeah. lang. So dalawang daliri lang. Hindi naman sampo. Okay. So every time you go to Malacanang to see the president, uh, it it's going to cost you a pin prick. Uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, reg regarding all of these testings and the uh, medical uh, stories, uh, we need to know because the. China sent a team to the Philippines to help us or to give us advice. And it's come out in the papers that this, this team is concerned. If we do not immediately construct what they call Fang Kang hospitals, I think this is those super big 1,000 bed hospitals that they built in three weeks or something, uh, we may not be able to cope with the number of positive cases that we will discover now that we are testing. Uh, I know the government and uh, through Secretary uh, Lito Galvez is doing an enormous job helped by the private sector to set up all of those mass quarantine uh, facilities. So I, I'm wondering, uh, is it possible that the Chinese team didn't know about this or kulang pa ba? Um, I, I can't really answer the question because I wasn't part of the uh, delegation that accompanied the Chinese team. No? So, siguro, maybe the Department of Health will be the best um, agency or Secretary Duque will be the best person to answer the question. Oh, okay. But okay. um, even that being said, um, we're looking naman at our beds, eh, our bed capacity, not just in NCR, but all over. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, no, uh, we have sufficient bed capacity naman. And then, um, we also look at the manpower, diba? And that's yeah. the reason why um, nagkaroon nga ng um, temporary ban, no? Uh, yeah. But that's already been clarified, right? Na only only those who have contracts as of uh, March 8th uh, are allowed to leave, uh, mm -hmm. but everybody else uh, will stay because we'll need the manpower here. And that's mm -hmm. the reason why we had to do that, uh, uh, make that decision para... To um, to strengthen our manpower capacity here, as far as the health health uh, care workers are concerned. Um, that being said, also we increased our capacity in terms of those quarantine and isolation facilities that Secretary Galvez has been talking about all along. Um, but uh, perhaps as a precaution, maybe that's what the Chinese doctors are probably advising us to do. So, given that, uh, maybe. Baka best si Secretary Duque lang ang sasagot. Okay, uh, what about the new case rates that uh, PhilHealth rolled out? Because I, I understand where they're coming from. Uh, last week, there was a photo on Facebook showing that the cost of treatment for a COVID-19 patient in a private hospital exceeded $1 million. And I, I suppose the PhilHealth immediately decided none of, this is this nonsense is not going to happen. So binago nila yung kanila mga case rates. What is the position of the IATF and the president? Because uh, Congressman Rufus Rodriguez is uh, asking the president to uh, well to direct PhilHealth to fully cover COVID uh, patients. Well, siguro ang sasabihin ko talang this is currently uh, being studied and reviewed. Constant, it's a constant process of studying and reviewing, no, uh, ng field health. Uh, but uh, syempre, they ha they also have have to look at the the survival then of the field health uh, as an institution in terms of mm -hmm. their fund is is concerned, no. Um, so that's being constantly reviewed and uh, considered and reconsidered by field health. If there are any announcements or if there are any any new developments with that with that regard, I think uh, PhilHealth will make the announcement. Man. Okay, what about you, mga punerarya? Because uh, oh. this is a real concern now. Uh, it's becoming an emotional issue and a community issue. Uh, people, 
are getting the impression na parang hindi natin ginagalaw or pinapakialaman itong mga funeral parlors na ito and uh, it's even frustrating some mayors uh, forcing them to give uh, warnings. Now, uh, what is the IATF going to do about rationalizing the charges and you know, uh, calming the fears of the operators themselves. Because, I mean, they're not running out of customers. So the problem is the customers have all run out of money and, and they still have their loved ones lying somewhere waiting to be uh, cremated or buried. Well, uh, as far as um, expenses are, are concerned, no, uh, DSWD is able naman to give a burial assistance. But uh, syempre, it's limited lang to 25,000 pesos. Mm -hmm. That's as far as DSWD is concerned, no? Um, and then we already issued um, resolutions from the IATF uh, directing mga LGUs to somehow in impose a price freeze or a price cap on the funeral parlors or establishments that are operating within their respective LGUs because we don't want sudden increases din sa mga pressure ng services ng mga funeral um, establishments, no? Um, then there's also that um, constant monitoring and coordination between LGUs and the funeral establishments and the DILG uh, with the funeral establishments as well. So it's actually, the IATF actually delegated the, that the, the, the bulk of the work to the DILG and it's the DILG now speaking uh, to the LGUs or coordinating the LGUs because they have my jurisdiction over those uh, funeral um, establishments. That being said, uh, the president already gave the uh, directive na dapat um, yung kung kailangan ng ano, uh, dapat kung if we have, we need to stick to the 12-hour rule no, dun sa cremation. So the DILG has been tasked na dapat um, wala ng delays pagdating sa ganyan. Kasi sometimes nagkakaroon ng delays kasi kailangan pa ng paperwork, kailangan pa ng mga certificates and all of these things and then nagkaka naghihintayin kasi o oh, sino magbabayad nito sino magbabayad niyan mm. all of that no uh, whereas we have to stick to the 12-hour rule so para ang message namin is that just stick to the 12-hour rule everything else naman can be fixed and we can look for solutions to those problems later on but because it is a health issue and a health concern then the 12 hour rule is a uh, is is uh, non negotiable so the body or the remains must be cremated disposed or buried within 12 hours of death pag the pag covid 19 kasi kailangan yung yeah yung cre yung cremation but yes uh, pag muslim kasi uh, our muslim yeah. brothers kasi they have a, a different ritual so yes yeah. uh, Hindi pa de cremation, so yes, yung ano, bur bur burial within 12 hours. Yeah, well, that's good to know, Secretary Nograles, because I heard of a particular case where the widow had to go back and forth from Baisa uh, in Novaliches to East Avenue three times para lang mapirmahan yung paperwork. And uh, I think if it simply becomes mandatory, we just get it over and done with yeah. documents to follow. Well, right. thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Secretary. I won't take any more of your time. Uh, please know that there are so many Filipinos who appreciate you, your work, and the work of the IATF. And, and we pray to God that you continue to remain healthy, stay strong, be safe. And uh, we love you. I just say that. We love you kasi talagang eh, pag ganitong sitwasyon, pag hindi tayo nagmahalan, lahat tayo magluluk sa. Thank you very much, sir. Ito yan. Thank you very much, Sito. And everybody uh, in, in media, congratulations and thank you so so much for the, all the hard work that you're doing. We really need your help no? um, in, in, in telling the people what the real score is and giving out the real news and to combat fake news. Because as I was attending the ASEAN, um, mm -hmm. summit yesterday uh, even these other nations have have uh, their own personal battles against fake news even within their own territories so it's uh, you know it's it's even a challenge in in their countries as well so thank you to the the legitimate media for giving out and uh, the the real news to the people that the news that matter most so okay. maraming salamat and we love you too <laughs> okay maraming salamat uh, secretary carlo nograles
Okay, next up we have uh, another cabinet member. This time let's uh, invite in Secretary William Dar and uh, let's find out what is uh, going on in his side of the neighborhood. Uh, Secretary William Dar, uh, are you there? Good morning. Paul. Okay, there. Uh, there you go. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, you, you know, uh, I asked my team to find you immediately because uh, I heard that uh, you have been calling on uh, big corporations, businessmen, etc., to start uh, the ball rolling in terms of food production, food security, and distribution. Could, would you be kind enough to uh, share that uh, uh, call uh, to our viewers, sir? Tama yung sito kasi ito, this is a new environment, a new normal, they call it. And uh, new normal, they call it. And uh, to ensure uh, household food security, we need to uh, really uh, tap all vacant spaces uh, in metro areas all over the country. And uh, we have started in Metro Manila and calling on all the big business, the uh, members of the seed industry, even uh, the uh, professional organizations, including that of the local government units, to really uh, uh, invest now for uh, uh, ensuring uh, food security at the household level. Mm -hmm. While we also say that there is enough food supplies uh, from the uh, production areas like uh, Baguio, and uh, Baguio, and dito po sa Nueva Vizcaya, dito sa Sariaya, Quezon, and other areas, I uh, iba itong COVID because you are locked down by like what we are having now. This is the time to uh, also use your energy to at least uh, plant your, uh, your vegetables. Uh, in your gardens, in your backyard, even vertical gardening is necessary doon sa mga fences ninyo na dito sa Metro Manila. And mm. the the reception is uh, tremendous. So we really are uh, there to partner with everyone. And we hope that this is a national movement that will take its course. Well, uh, I have to bring to your attention and to compliment you, Mr. Secretary, because in fairness to the Department of Agriculture, the supply of vegetables and rice has been uh, sustained, has been consistent uh, in the different barangays that uh, I have passed by, uh, because I have an official pass, by the way. Para magkaliwanag lang, I have a PCOO pass. And practically every sari-sari store na I check had vegetables. So clearly the supply is out there. Uh, the rice is uh, uh, replaced on a regular basis. But I suppose uh, the need for food security now uh, is in terms of the future when, when jobs are affected, when incomes are affected. Mabuti na yung may natatanim dun sa bakura natin. Is that the case, uh, Secretary? So that's one uh, major objective, and we, we have to contend as well, Sito, yung uh, iba glo global trading is somehow uh, impeded. There are those countries that are uh, also trying to ensure food security for the respective uh, people. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a, a call for everyone to really elevate uh, food production in this country, and that's why uh, we have asked government to add budget for expanding our coverage in terms of uh, interventions in the countryside. And that uh, I'm happy to mention, Sito, that on top of the regular programs that we have refocused, uh, nagdagdag pa ang gobyerno para dun sa expansion of uh, rice production areas. Uh, 8.5 million have been added, and we are now preparing the ground, so to speak, 
or early planting of rice so that you can uh, avoid the typhoons that are coming late August and September. I, I just saw a clip from a Pampanga cooperative of rice farmers, and uh, they actually confirmed that they said there are a lot more available land, uh, rice lands, for planting, but they need uh, more of the solar irrigation uh, systems that uh, the Department of Agriculture has been rolling out. Madali po bang makuha yung mga uh, solar pumps na yon, uh, given COVID-19? Will we still be able to access, purchase this uh, uh, equipment so that our farmer cooperatives can can uh, carry on planting? Yeah, uh, the solar powered uh, irrigation system, uh, we, we are in a final stage of uh, uh, pursuing this uh, with an Israeli group, a, a funding of about 15 billion pesos will be utilized, uh, which will be uh, rolled out uh, last quarter of this year. But, uh, you know, we, we have to now optimize the use of the existing irrigation systems this uh, rainy season. Anyway, the, the, the wet planting, the wet season planting is coming. So there will be enough water for this uh, the season. And every space that is planted to rice will be supported by these new programs of uh, government. Uh, okay, the, the present level of uh, rice adequacy or rice efficiency in the country today is 87%. Now, we have calculated with the investment of 8.5 billion CITO, yeah. uh, this will give us another 6% increase of our uh, rice requirement, so bringing us to 93%. So, yung 7%, mm. hopefully, can even cover that, yung potential deficit. But, uh, of course, ang ating last resort is opening up yung importation pa rin kasi nandyan na yung batas na rice tarification law. So these are all the strategies that we are uh, putting in place para uh, we will not repeat the 2018 experience. Okay, well, uh, that's a lot of good news, uh, Secretary. And worst case scenario, we can always ask the IATF to issue a memorandum na Iban na yung Anli Rice. I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just kidding, but uh, it's good to know that you are really uh, pushing now for this urban uh, gardening program. We, we hope that the DILG will support it. And uh, we are always uh, available if you have uh, future announcements. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, please stay safe, stay strong, and stay healthy, Mr. Secretary. Maraming salamat, Sito. Again, yesterday I got the support of the ILG because uh, it's preparation time, it's harvest time this season, and now planting time by starting May. So we requested the SEC annual yesterday to advise all the local government units to now get ready, partnering with us, to uh, have the biggest investment so far in the history of Philippine agriculture or uh, increasing food sufficiency level in this country. Well, uh, we look forward to that, sir, and you can uh, trust in our 100% support. God bless you, Secretary Dar. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> okay, we love you too, Mr. Secretary. Let's promote love in the country. Maraming salamat. Okay, and uh, that, that was our uh, interview with Secretary William Dar of the Department of Agriculture. We are calling out our viewers to please start looking at your gardens. I know you love your orchid, your orchids, your bromeliads. You love all of your ferns. I, I love them too, but... Uh, mine have started uh, becoming an endangered species, being replaced by by pechay, kangkong, ampalaya, upo. That is going to be the name of the game because if we learn something from uh, ECQ 
2020. Uh, it is that if you don't have a backyard garden, you are going to be having sleepless nights. We will go for a quick break, two-minute break. When we come back, more of our guests here on Agenda. Okay, uh, welcome back to Agenda. We now carry on to our uh, next interview. A lot of our viewers, I'm sure, are parents who are now climbing the walls, pulling their hair, uh, wondering how are they going to survive the extended community quarantine if it ever gets extended because they have uh, to teach uh, their children, they have to act teachers to their children. Now, uh, we've, we've uh, asked a friend, uh, someone who is in the know as far as uh, homeschooling is concerned, especially now that the government or the and uh, other uh, academic institutions are debating, studying, considering how to go about uh, education in the new normal. Uh, one is to push back the opening of classes to 
August, uh, that's still up in the air. And of course, many schools have decided to just end the school year at the end of the month and also uh, online education for many colleges. Let's go to our next guest. Uh, our next guest is uh, a homeschooling mother uh, and has been doing it for 10 years. She is vice president of the Philippine Homeschoolers Association. She is also the author of Homeschool, How to Homeschool Without Losing Your Mind. We have with us Novi and Tan. Novi, good Hello. morning. Good morning. Magandang umaga po sa kanila. Kamusta na? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, Novi, uh, just for the benefit of our viewers, uh, are you having a difficult time under ECQ or this is normal for you to be at home teaching children uh, homeschooling? Totoo yung sinabi mo. This is not a really um, adjustment for us because... I have been homeschooling for 14 years now, and being here at home, lockdown is really a normal thing for us. Okay. So, <laughs> hindi kami masado nag-adjust on that level. Okay. Uh, pero binaha ka ba ng mga SOS or uh, call for help from your friends who don't even know the first thing about homeschooling? Definitely. Grabe lang yung mga messages ko. I have, I have a page in um, Facebook which is iHomeschoolPH and we also have this page of Philippine Homeschool Association. So, ang daming mga requests, ang daming mga inquiries about providers. Kasi, I had this survey and asked some of the parents, would you, after this quarantine, April 30, would they still go out and then maybe planning to enroll their kids uh, this coming June or August? And they... Most of them, I think 80% of them, will say no. They would rather teach their kids at home. Okay, so it's a discovery. I mean, uh, most I thought most people would say, Di ba, Lina, babalik ko na sa eskwela, mabu ano, makakalbo na ako sa sakit ng ulo. But 80% uh, ng na-survey mo, oh, uh, you yeah. said they would rather do homeschool. Kasi ano eh, see to, it's the safety first eh, di ba? Okay. It's authority first. It's the health. That is the more concern of the parents right now. Okay, they, now. They don't have to risk going out and, you know, thinking of what their kids may catch up around. So that is one of the beauty of homeschooling, eh. Kasi mas pareregulate mo, al alam mo kung nasaan sila, alam mo na safe sila. So that's the assurance of the parents as well. Hmm. But what about competency and quality? Uh, yan ang always the first question ng mga magulang. Pag nag-homeschool ba ako, ang uh, aking bang, uh, uh, am I good enough? And how will I know that my children have actually learned from me? Yeah, it's true. Lagi niya ng tanong, di ba? Kaya ko ba to? Mm -hmm. uh, hindi ko alam, kaya ko nga sila nilalagay sa kwelahan, di ba? That's why mm -hmm. I don't know. But you know, I believe we are the first, foremost, the best teachers to our kids. Okay. It is not, the goal is you set the tone. It's not about it's not about the academics. I think it will follow, but I believe relationship is more important than academics. It's the trust factor. Like now, I'm sure everyone right now has an awakening of what's happening, what really matters most of happening around, and mm -hmm. you'll be able to evaluate it. Even if you teach your kids academics and all that stuff, but if you don't have relationship and the trust factor with your kids, diba, it's meaningless. Okay. Now, now but uh, what, what is the success rate of homeschoolers? I mean, I only, we, my wife uh, actually should get all the credit for it. I was just the driver and the tourist guide. Uh, pero <laughs> nag one year homeschooling kami for, for our daughter. Okay. And I have to say, it is probably one of the best, most meaningful time we had with her because uh, we also traveled all over the Philippines when yeah. we were th teaching history. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, masarap yun eh, kasi uh, hindi, wala siyang, wala siyang ano, wala siyang, hindi siya nakabox. Okay. As in, when you wake up in the morning, you'll be able, there's a lot that you can be able to expand. Learning is everything around in your home. And even with all of this COVID-19, actually, I was trying to teach the kids 
um, the parents right now na you don't have to just you know do what the, the school is doing you can be relatable with what you have right now like for example covid 19 there's a lot of um collaboration that you can teach your kids in that area like science they can research about uh, different types of pandemics in years that have come not only now they can also make a write-up about that and make presentations and so madaming collaboration and be relevant so that you can have this relaxed space lang uh, while teaching your kids because it's not about naman the you know the nitty-gritty competencies that we have in school that is required you can be relatable and just talk deeper things of what's happening and learnings of what's happening around and you so, know yeah so it's factual uh critical uh, critical thinking hindi na yung puri oo kasi no matter what kasi yun naman ang importante di ba when our kids go out yun naman lagi di ba you need to be a problem solver you need mm. to know how to observe and discern what's happening around rather okay. than being reduced of all those routines. Okay, so last question, no V success rate. Uh, yung mga alam mo na nag, uh, nag uh, homeschooling, kamusta ang kanilang uh, outcome uh, in terms of being accepted to college or graduating from college and getting the certificate and getting jobs? Sobrang dami. Like, ako, I'm just gonna tell my, my story, you know, because when my homeschooling for 14 years. I have two kids now who are in conventional school here near us in Antipolo because I live in Antipolo. And um, they're thriving on their own right now and they were able to adjust with uh, people in terms of, because the question will always ask, diba, paano yung social? Well, syempre, lahi ka nasa loob ng bahay, diba? Well, the good thing is when uh, we have this uh, good thing that we're doing at home. There are like 10 families who comes to my house once a week. So they, my kids are getting to know to uh, zero age hanggang sa mga 14 years old, 15 years old, iba't ibang klaseng tao ang namimit nila. So may exercise yung kanilang social um, encounter not only with one age group but with a lot of age groups. So no, when they went to the conventional school, it's not hard for them to adjust on that level so okay. different age different types of um people they can be able to communicate with confidence okay thank you very much novi because uh, uh at least we just want to reassure the parents out there not to be afraid of homeschooling to try it out to go through the experience you're doing a very great service to the people and uh ngayong social distancing na llamado pa kayo Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Tito. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much for Stay it. strong, stay healthy, and stay safe. God bless you. God bless. Okay. Now, let's go to our uh, next uh, guest. And uh, we he was supposed to be uh, uh, interviewed yesterday, but uh, we just had some technical problems. We have with us Kim Perculeza, a COVID survivor. Let's find out from Kim how he's doing. Uh, Kim, good morning to you. Uh, hi, Paul. Good morning, Paul. Um, as of now, naman po, uh, I'm really well. Okay. okay uh, kailan ka ba nagkasakit and saan ka nagkasakit? Um, as far as I could tell po, hindi ko, wala po talaga eh. Wala pong idea kung saan ko po nakuha. Okay. Or, oh, typical day lang po kasi siya. So, parang mid-March po yun. Parang ganun po. And... Uh, yung typical day po, lalabas ka po para kumain, so, tapos babiyahe ka po, parang ganun po. And yun, tapos the next day po, uh, lumabas na po yung symptoms. So, you can't remember a particular person na, ah, yun, yun yung umubo sa akin, na bahinga na ko, na, no, no defining moment, you just went out to do a gimmick or to eat out and next day may sakit ka na. Opo, wala, hindi mo po talaga masasabi kasi you can't point fingers at people din naman po kasi hindi nyo naman po nakikita kung sino po yung carrier, sino po yung may sakit, and mm -hmm. yun po. 
Kaya, I have no idea po talaga. How long did uh, your suffering take? Kasi yung iba, sinasabi, three days lang, okay na. Yung iba, ten days na, naka, nakahiga pa rin. Uh, what, what was your experience? Um... Um, nagsimula po yung day ko na ano, I started to feel like I'm having a fever. Tapos po, ayun, tas as the day progressed po, dumala po yung lagnat para pong um, para pong trangkaso siya. So, mm -hmm. para pong dahil po magla-lockdown na po tas parang na, na paranoid na rin po ako, I went straight to the hospital na po at that point. Mm -hmm. And, and Then, uh, are you living alone? Are you living alone or with your family? Um, no po. Um, since college po, tas, uh, nung nag-work po ako, uh, my, my family, my parents po, tas yung ate ko po, they live abroad po sa Qatar. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so ako lang po nandito sa Pinas. So medyo, in, in a way, blessing na rin yun. Uh, Gano'n katagal bago ka naka-recover? Ito. Two weeks po, two weeks, three weeks max po, parang ganun. Pero yung nawala po yung lagnat ko after two or three days po. Tapos may konting ubo, may ganun po. Mm -hmm. Pero still po, we can never be too sure po talaga. Okay. Uh, I guess after that experience, uh, una, uh, last two questions ko, nabutas bubble sa mo. <laughs> um, um, hindi, na, hindi naman po, kasi po... Uh, Tino, parang sinusuporta po ko ng relatives and yung government po and mga city health officials po, mga ganun po, they provided support din po sa akin. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't complain okay. po with anything. Okay, uh, I, I see this photo of you on the screen. I, I gather you're a musician, you're a performer. Pasensya ka na dahil ako ay, eh, alam mo na, uh, Jurassic na ako, hindi, ko na, hindi na ako masyadong <laughs> touch. Okay. But but is it possible that you got it in one of your one of your gigs? Um, hindi ko po kasi masasabi din po eh kasi nung mga time din naman po yun yeah I was playing in a bunch of gigs po pero I'm not a person who interacts with I know with lots of people lalo po sa mga strangers kasi po I'm I'm not saying that I'm an introvert pero whenever I'm not close to someone hindi ko po masadong haka ano so parang Mostly, kaibigan ko lang po talaga yung nakakahalo-bilo ko po. Okay. Well, uh, what, do you have any message for our for our viewers? Uh, uh, lalo na sa ngayon, ang daming pasaway, ang dami pa rin makulit, uh, who insist on going out. Uh, do you have any message for them, uh, Kim? Um, ang masasabi ko lang po sa mga tao po ay um, don't be reckless and don't go out po kasi... It's not worth the risk po talaga. Like, yung hirap po talaga when recovering and like suffering to, through the symptoms. Sobrang hirap po talaga at siguro po hindi nyo maiisip dahil wala po kayo sa position. Pero just put yourself in their shoes po, in my shoes po na sobrang hirap po talaga. Ayun, tas to all the patients po doon na nagsasuffer pa rin po, you may be isolated and... Uh, you're maybe by yourself, but you're not fighting this battle alone. But be strong, boy, and don't give up. Okay, <clears throat> I'm sure uh, those patients uh, might get the chance to be watching us because I understand. <coughs> Sorry, Kim. Signal TV has uh, installed uh, monitors uh, for for our programs at different hospitals, para naman makatulong na. Ma inform at ma entertain yung mga pasyente. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Kim, because uh, not a lot of people are willing to go out and uh, tell them, uh, tell people that they have been victims of COVID-19 and they are survivors. Ikaw ba yun, nakapagbigay na ng, uh, ng blood plasma sa PGH? Um, as of now po, hindi pa po eh. Pero if ever given the chance po, hanggat kaya po magbigay at mga katulong bibigay po ako. Uh, I, I think uh, you are required to have a two weeks straight of good health. Uh, wala kang communicable disease or uh, injury, uh, serious ailment. And after that, you can actually call UPPGH para makatulong ka. Because uh, I really want to encourage you to do that because you will surely save another patient just by giving your, your plasma. 
Thank you very much, Kim. Please uh, stay Thank strong, you, stay safe, stay healthy. God bless, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Okay, God bless you too, bro. And uh, that that's uh, our uh, uh, Kim, that's our guest, Kim Perculeza. Uh, I, I'm having a difficult time reading things here, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, we will move on to our next guest. It's been a struggle to to get him all morning because of the uh, connections we have uh, on board. Uh, the Edsa, the Edsa traffic czar Bong Nebriha. Good morning, uh, Bong. Uh, welcome to Agenda. Okay. Okay, I think uh, someone doesn't want Bong to talk to me this morning. Uh, can someone please do something about this? Uh, uh, Bong, are you there? Okay, uh, can't hear you, bro. Uh, you're not uh, get going through. Uh, we're going to find out. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you, Bong. Uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, th that's uh, the problem of uh, our times now. And actually, I made a note to speak to all of you out there because uh, I, I, I've realized the new normal is that most of us are going to communicate, stay in touch, uh, do business via internet uh, like we are doing right now. And I just want to give you an ex uh, idea of, of the experience. When we started broadcasting Agenda on a work-from-home basis, I relied mainly on my computer uh, to do the broadcast. And I have to be honest, it was very frustrating because uh, the signal kept, kept uh, going in and out. And it was primarily because we were using pocket Wi-Fi's or those portable Wi-Fi's uh, in the house. And, and so uh, it went on for a couple of weeks. And in my frustration, I just really reached out to our officers such as Shena Olaso and then uh, Malu Alvendia uh, and uh, uh, Marco Borlongan of PLDT. And they graciously made an accommodation to put a emergency installation of fiber optic straight into the house. And that helped immensely. Yesterday, uh, I'm part of a discipleship group. And uh, I was uh, speaking to one of my fellow members, Kim Matienza, who's also with uh, the Capuso channel, Channel 7. And uh, he had a similar problem while we were doing our our uh, afternoon prayers, and I asked, why don't you get PLDT fiber optic? Because you guys can see the difference in, in my video quality. And, and he said, but I do have PLDT fiber optic. Now, here's the catch. In fact, Kim Atienza even has two installations. Here's the catch, which my wife actually explained to me. When you do this insta when you have these installations like in PLDT, it's actually a great setup. You can prioritize uh, who has first, uh, or you would, you can program who has first priority in the use of the setup. So, like here in the house, there are four of us who are using the internet, and I have first priority. Not because I'm boss. Not because I'm not the boss. The ladies are the boss, but because it's primarily for work, for agenda, sh sh my wife has prioritized my setup to use the internet first. And everyone else follows in, in the order of ascendancy or use. You can also actually program the system so that you can monitor who's using it, how much they're using it, when they're using it, and what programs or apps they are using the internet for. So like we have a house helper and uh, we know that she uses it for, for FaceTime, she uses it for, uh, for YouTube, etc. cetera, and, and that's fine with us. But at least we know what use is being made of the internet. Now, this, this is really useful, this is really good because uh, you can now uh, program your internet. Now here's the catch. 
if your children are smarter than you, or you are in bad graces with your wife, who is the program administrator, you are in trouble. And that's what I was telling Kim Achenza. I said, <clears throat> chances are, Kim, that your children have programmed the fiber optic, the PLDT fiber optic program, uh, internet, so that they get priority. And as it turns out, the children and the wife are using the two fiber connections for uh, Netflix. So uh, that that is going to suck up so much, so much of the uh, uh, internet, and you're going to suffer. So going back to this experience, uh, the computer setup and the PLDT fiber optic connection improved the, the everything. Now, of course, you want to be better. You want quality, more quality. And it took us a lot of prayers. I uh, trust me, we really, really prayed because we tried using our my cell phone. I have an iPhone 11, uh, but <clears throat> I needed a speaker and an earphone to go with it. And I found out that uh, when you do this, you need an audio interface so you can use both the, the earpiece and the microphone on your iPhone. Now, where am I going to get an audio interface under ECQ? That's, that's basically a hope and a prayer and a miracle to boot. So we went back to the computer. Uh, maybe we can get a um, webcam. And, and we found a webcam. Uh, we got a webcam, which is now connected. I just hope that, that you can see better quality. And, and that's all great. That's all working for now. But here's the thing. When you go into this sort of things, you will discover that if you buy any equipment today or this month, chances are they're the latest model, okay, you will discover that they will require for your laptop or your computer to be uh, a very new model or at least with an iOS program that is of the latest uh, version because uh, we we got a an earpiece just yesterday that I can't work together with my phone and then I was going to get an earpiece from my friend Willie we, uh, Willie Sung who owns uh, who's the distributor of both in the Philippines and I realized that a we are going to have to send someone to Green Hills to get the, the headphone from uh, the store. Uh, it just does not sit well with me. I will not suck, risk anyone's life to go to the epicenter of the San Juan uh, COVID uh, infections uh, just for an earpiece. So, uh, we, And then I, we also figured out that to use that earpiece, I would have had to buy a new computer. So again, where am I going to buy a new computer? And that's going to cost a lot of money, somewhere in the neighborhood of about eighty to 110,000 pesos. So all of this uh, just basically tells you that the new normal is going to require that you first study and understand the technology and how those different different uh, parts or uh, equipment uh, relate or interrelate. So if you were going to buy a, a new webcam or a high definition camera and you're going to buy an earpiece, they must all work together with your laptop or your computer or your iPhone and your iPhone or your laptop must have the latest iOS. Okay, so there we go. Now, you won't see it. You won't see it here. One day, I, I hope to do that. You will, but I have a light here on my side, uh, a ring light in front of me. I have the room lights on, etc. Uh, and, and what's happening is these are fill-in lights, and I and I've got a huge window beside me because you you will find out that you can have a great camera. Uh, but the lights is going to determine the quality of your video. And another thing, you are going to have, you, you will buy a great microphone, 
But then uh, you will notice with some of our interviewees, there's an echo or the sound quality isn't good. I'm not saying my sound quality is great because I'm just using a built-in mic. Uh, we still need to get our hands on a lapel mic. But, you know, one thing that many people fail to consider is the uh, bounce of sound in the room. Okay. Uh, in any case, uh, enough of me sharing this uh, journey. It's two weeks and a half of journey, but uh, sorry, you're going to have to go through it in the new normal of today's business. Now, let's try again. Uh, let's see if we can get uh, Bong Nebriha back because I want to find out about all of this uh, Pasawais on Edsa. Bong, good morning. I hope you can hear me. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry, Bong, we're not hearing you. I don't know if it's you or if it's me. I think it's me. It's not you. <laughs> in, a, in any case, I think you can hear me, but I can't hear you. And uh, we, we, we're we going to have to try again, Bong. But uh, uh, I promise we will get you back by hook or by crook. You do stay safe, my friend. In any case, uh, I think uh, that's it for the day. We, we are going to try to get Bong Nebriha tomorrow, Friday, and also the, I believe uh, the Highway Patrol group uh, will be available tomorrow. And um, I guess uh, we will try to get in more, more uh, good news for you. I, I don't know. Uh, I just got a update uh ready uh are we ready uh gab uh, you actually fixed the problem with bong nebria okay well i i think that's it i'm just gonna have to uh call it a day uh we've tried our best but thank you anyway bong you you've been up since uh the beginning of the program on standby for us and uh in any case thank you ladies and gentlemen for joining us this morning uh like i said uh, there's a lot of things going on, the good news, uh, our uh, recoveries are now higher than our fatalities. Government is doing a lot of things. Please stay safe, stay healthy, stay strong, and please try to stay indoors. It's just a few weeks, a uh, couple of weeks more or uh, a week and a half more, and we're going to get through this, I hope and I pray. Have a great day. Uh, God bless you. Love you all. Take care.